welcome to episode 27 of Yarn to Table, a podcast about my knitting life. If this is your first time watching the podcast, welcome. Thanks so much for checking it out. I hope you find something here that you like and that you'll subscribe so that you can watch in the future. And if you do want to become more involved, we have a Ravelry group. You can find the link in the doobly-doo. Uh, or by searching for Yarn to Table on Ravelry, and that's where you're going to find show notes for every episode. It's also where you can participate in knit-alongs and giveaways. We do have a knit-along going on right now, the Summer Garment Cal, which is running through the end of August, so check out the Ravelry group for more information on that. I'm co-hosting that with Anna of the Dunkel Grown podcast. And um, there's also an Introduce Yourself thread in there and an Ask Me Anything thread. I'd definitely appreciate you um, introducing yourself if you feel so inclined so that I can welcome you and I know who you are. Um, on Ravelry and Instagram, I am Celeste Full. My project pages are pretty up to date, so if you have any questions about them, um, about projects, you can ask me directly, but you can also check out the project pages. Each one has a blogs tab that links to the relevant episodes of this podcast, so you can see something more in depth that you might have missed. And uh, on Instagram, of course, I share progress and other fun things from my life. So today I am drinking iced tea again. We have been having really lovely weather here, um, but because it just rained, it somehow got like a little bit muggier today. So um, I was definitely looking for something more refreshing. And this is actually a peony white tea that my mother just brought me from Chicago. And if you are interested in seeing my really easy um, cold brew method for making iced tea, I show you how I made this in um, a vlog that you will see popping up on the channel probably tomorrow um, for this weekend. So that's another little piece, uh, little announcement. Um, I've decided that I want to do sort of my version of Vlogist by vlogging the weekends in August. Um, so you will be able to see what I've gotten up to um, this weekend, and then I'm going to do another three. Um, the weekend after this, um, Ryan's going to be working, so it's probably going to be um, a bit of a craftier weekend, although possibly it's just going to be a big homework weekend. I'm not really sure. But then the two weekends at the end of the month, we are going on uh, trips, so you're going to get a little bit of travel vlogging, which should be interesting. Okay, so I do have an FO to share with you, and that is this guy. This pattern is called Pippin the Raccoon, and he is by Julie L. Anderson. And I knit him up in Knit Pick Stroll in Dove Heather Black and White. Um, as you can see, he's a little bit uneven. And, um... And I also had some issues with some laddering in these spots where the neck happens. Um, they were just a little tight and I, I, I wasn't really able to fix it. So he's not perfect, but I do think that he's still very cute. Um, I actually knit him for my husband. He's a surprise, so he's going to um, get him on his birthday in a couple days. We're really into stuffed animals. I don't know what to tell you guys. You might think it's a weird gift for my husband, but that's just how we are. Um, so let's see. So this pattern was knit in the round from the bottom up and the uh, legs, arms, and tail were knit separately and then joined as you went. So there wasn't any seaming. The ears and the snout were done by picking up stitches. And then the black of the eyes was done in intarsia in the round and the white was actually done as duplicate stitch and then these are some safety eyes that I had in my stash from other stuffies um, oh and like I said the snout was also picked up and knit in the round and stuffed um, yeah so he's very cute I, I am very pleased with how he looks he was not the most fun thing to make though um, I usually have more fun with stuffies he was just a little bit fiddly with the, I, I hate to complain because I know that pattern writing is very difficult, but I feel like there were some places where the pattern really could have been more clear and it would have given me a bit of a better experience. So for example, for the ears, 
they had you mark where the ear was going to start. And then they just said, like, pick up however many stitches and then turn around and pick them up in the other direction, right? And that worked for the first ear. But then for the second ear, because they didn't tell me whether I should go behind that row or in front of that row, I ended up orienting myself to where I would have had, um, if I was going in the right direction, I would have had a row of pearl bumps exposed because of how I had picked up. So it was just like they didn't give you enough information to keep you from sort of like making those mistakes and having to go back. And when you're doing something like picking up teeny tiny stitches, that's just not the most fun thing to have to rip out and try again. Like when I'm knitting something that's just for fun, more of like a process and it's not fiddly, it's not such a big deal if you make a mistake and you have to pull it out. But when you are doing something like picking up really, really tiny stitches, that's just not the most fun thing to have to do twice. So it kind of made the experience not as great. Um, another issue was with the intarsia. The chart was written um, in a really weird way where as you were going up in the written instructions, it suddenly said like, okay, now start using the chart but when you turned to the chart, it was charting the whole head, and so it had all these rows of gray. So you didn't really know what row you were on in the chart versus in the written instructions. I know I'm not explaining this well. It was very confusing. So basically, it set me up to where it was difficult to switch into following the chart. And then when I was following the chart, it was only charting the front. It wasn't charting the rest of the head. And so I ended up having to use the written instructions so that I could know what to do for the rest of it. Because, so here's what I told you guys. I was going to tell you about intarsia and the round, which is really cool. So I actually looked up how to do this before um, I got to that point in the pattern because I didn't expect, uh, I expected it to be kind of complicated. And so I just wanted a video instead of trying to read the instructions. It turns out it's not actually that complicated. So normally when you do intarsia, you're going along with your gray, and then you have a separate piece of black, and then you have a separate piece of gray, and then another piece of black, and then another piece of gray, right? If you were knitting this whole thing flat, just back and forth. You would have three hanks of gray and two hanks of black. But because you're in the round, when you come all the way around here, suddenly your black is on the wrong side of the eye. So you can't do that. So instead, what you do is you come around and you do a little short row and you come back. So that in the round, you're knitting it as if it's flat so that you can do intarsia, just going back and forth, back and forth. And in the back, you are crossing over so that essentially you're turning the entire head into one big short row and overlapping so that it stays together. Now that probably doesn't make a lot of sense if you're not familiar with short rows or intarsia to begin with. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to like try to do some big demonstration of how those work. But if you've done intarsia before and you've done short rows before, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so essentially, I couldn't go just off of the chart because the chart didn't tell me how many more gray stitches I was going to do on the edges and where I was going to wrap and turn. So I was following the regular instructions, but I don't like doing things that aren't charted. So then I started to just sort of guess for myself where I wanted to wrap and turn, and I started following the chart. And I think because I, I did that, it just got me off a little bit. So, um, so I ended up making his eyes just slightly uneven, which you can see. And then when I picked up or the no for the snout again like picking up the stitches was so fiddly and so it ended up just looking a little bit closer to the side just being like a little bit a little bit uneven hopefully it just gives them some character but yeah I I was excited to do the intarsia in the round I thought it was gonna be fun and it was fun to a certain degree but I just think it could have been a lot more fun if the pattern had given me all the information I needed there on the chart um, instead of sort of making me patch together the chart and the written instructions. Uh, it's just not 
the most fun when you have to do that kind of stuff. You want to be focused on the knitting and not on trying to sort of decipher the pattern, right? So I would recommend him if you are just completely in love with him and you have to have a raccoon. I do think he's the cutest raccoon on Ravelry. I looked at a lot of patterns and I do think he's the cutest one. But I would not necessarily recommend him if you're just like, I'd like to try a stuffy for the first time. Like, there's a lot of easier stuffies that are also cute. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. But I'm really glad I made him. I think he turned out adorable and um, I think Ryan's gonna like him, so. He was finished um, near the beginning of this week and he was sort of one in a series of uh, knitting misadventures. <laughs> this has been a bit of a difficult week for me with my knitting. You will see I have a lot of works in progress going on and part of that is that as I would hit certain frustrations with some of them, I would, I would, um, I would want to move on to something else. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll show you my works in progress now. So I have a lot and I haven't made a ton of progress on each one because I, I haven't been very monogamous this week. I've really sort of like touched each of these at some point. Um, some of them I'm, actually I would say all of them I'm enjoying a lot. I, um, I didn't have... You know, I, I, it, it wasn't the most relaxing evening time knitting. I was on a deadline and, you know, whatever, um, with this guy. And then the other issue that I came up with this week is trying to find gauge for a sweater that I really want to start and just feeling, um, kind of losing my steam and, uh, and stopping. <laughs> so that's been kind of set to one side. Let me show you that now. That'll be my next one. Um, but then pretty much all my other, all my other knitting has been perfectly fun. So, um, it, it hasn't been the worst week by any means. Let's see here. So this is the wispy cardigan. Let's see if I can give you a better photo than that insert. Okay. It's by Hannah Fettig. And I knit up a swatch this is Sweet Sparrow Yarns in the Gosling base, which is MCN, Merino Cashmere Nylon, and the colorway Queenie, which is inspired by Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Um, as you can see, it's pooling a lot in the swatch, but I don't think it's going to be much of an issue when it's uh, on a larger project. So, I really love this color. I love this yarn. I love this uh, pattern. I'm excited to make it, um, but I I knit up, I, I was trying to be good because, you know, my Andromeda doesn't fit as well as I would like it to, and I thought, you need to take your time. So I knit a swatch and blocked it, and while it was blocking, I thought, it seems perfect. Let me just cast on. So I did a um, tubular cast on. I'm borrowing the needles right now so yeah I'm at the point where I'm borrowing needles now that's how many projects I have. Now granted I don't have very many needles because I tend to not have very many projects at one time but um, yeah I'm about at my limit for how many I like to have going. Anyway it I, I did a tubular cast on the project doesn't call for it but I just think it's really pretty when you're doing ribbed um, edges so it takes about four extra rows to make it happen, but it's really worth it. As you can see, it just looks like the ribbing disappears over the edge. See that? Instead of having any kind of ridge there. So I did this tubular cast on, this is 88 stitches, and it's meant to be the cuff of the sleeve. Now that seems huge to me, right? Does that seem huge to you? So. I have some concerns about just the size, even if I got gauge. Now granted, this isn't gonna be on my wrist, it's meant to be here, but still, I mean, that's like a very loose sleeve. Anyway, so I have some concerns about, even if I get gauge about the size, whether I might want to size down the sleeves. And then also, once my gauge dried, I measured it and it's a little big. 
So I think I need to do another gauge swatch. Hopefully I will get gauge with one needle size down. And if I do, then I am either going to, um, you know, be such a baby that I don't want to rip all of this out. And I, <laughs> I will just add the one needle size down and let the first couple rows be in a larger size. Um, which I don't think is a huge deal to be honest, but I'll only do that if I decide that 88 stitches isn't too many. If I decide that I really want to alter the pattern, then I'm definitely going to rip it out. So that's a decision that needs to be made. I think I'm going to make it after I figure out what needles I can actually get gauge with. So it's like there's all these things rattling around in my head. I was also thinking about maybe altering the pattern to knit the sleeves in the round, um, which I think would be nice. But because I'm concerned about the size of them, I also like the idea of knitting them flat because then when I'm seaming them up, I could, you know, maybe take in a little bit extra. It's not like I'm going to be taking in a ton, but I could take in a little bit extra. Um, I just like the idea that I could like have that flexibility. So what I'm thinking now is I probably will do a second gauge swatch, hopefully get gauge. If I do get gauge, I will probably rip this out and then re-knit it still flat, but possibly a little bit smaller. So we will see, but I've been really stalled on this because I can't really make that decision and I'm also not particularly excited about those next steps. Like knitting a gauge swatch just isn't as much fun as knitting a project. So I'm a little stalled out on this, but that's okay. Sometimes you need to just put your project in the corner and give it a minute and then wait until you're feeling it again. And um, that's what I'm going to do. Even though I really would like to be going on a garment right now, I just need to wait until I'm feeling it. I need to remember to take my time with garments because they take a long time to knit and it's worth putting in the investment to make sure that they fit well. That's, that's where I want my focus to be right now. My next whip is living in my La Bien Aimee bag. And this is my void shawl. So August means it's pre-fall. And pre-fall means I feel like knitting things that um, are going to be fun to wear in the fall. So, hence the void. This gorgeousness is Malabrigo Rios, which is a worsted base in the colorway glitter. I got it at a local yarn shop in Cambridge. I think it was called Mind's Eye Yarn. And this pumpkin pie slice is where I was when I showed you before. Um, and I have just knit on it a tiny bit since then. I think I just knit later that Sunday last week after I showed this to you. And then I haven't picked it up since then. But um, I really enjoy this. I really like the fabric I'm getting. The yarn is really great to work with. It's lovely to see the colors playing. And the texture is, although a bit complicated, intuitive enough that it's not frustrating. It, you're not like just making mistakes constantly and knits up reasonably quickly, especially since it's also worsted weight. So I'm getting, I'm getting, you know, for a couple sittings to have this much of the shawl done. Um, a couple really short sittings I, I think is making pretty good progress. So yeah, I just really, really like this texture and this yarn and I like the way they work together. So that is my void shawl. Um, it is by, the pattern is by Melanie Berg. And it's going to be a really big crescent using four skeins of worsted. So I am excited about that. A lot of people responded to my um, comments about how I'm experimenting with pulling from the outside of the skein. 
Um, as I said, I still haven't knit a ton on this, so I guess it remains to be seen, but right now I'm not a big convert. Um, I think if I were always knitting somewhere that this was sitting on a flat surface that was below me so that I was always pulling in an upward direction, then that would be one thing. But I'm typically knitting where it has to sit like right next to me or something. And um, so my pulling is coming more from the side naturally than pulling up. And I guess I could train myself to just do more of an upward motion, but I don't like to have to stop and pull a yarn. I want just the knitting motion to seamlessly be pulling the yarn itself, um, which is one thing that I just really, really like about um, center pull balls because you can put them really anywhere and have that happen. You don't have to pull up necessarily. So, you know, it's fine, but I don't think, I don't think I've been converted. Next up is my on the go sock in my nine and three quarters bag. This is my Fred and George socks. The yarn is by Nora George Yarns. It's very wild. And I knit on this uh, a little bit. Also last Sunday, we went over to have dinner with my sister-in-law and brother-in-law and their sons. Um, actually, my other brother-in-law and his roommate and my parents-in-law were there for dinner as well. Um, so it's a big family thing. And uh, I wanted to have some knitting. We also watched Game of Thrones with them. So uh, I took my sock and I ended up doing the heel. So there you go, just a little fish lips kiss heel. And now I'm on to the foot. And um, I haven't knit on it since then because it's really just my only go project. My, uh, my like social knitting project. But I think I'm probably gonna take it with me. We're going to dinner at a friend's house today. Actually, the friends who had the baby that I knit the Tokyo hoodie for. So um, I will probably take this with me so that I have something to work on while we chat. Um, but yeah. I have so many more socks that I wanna make right now. Um, <laughs> so it's like part of me does want to, to sort of get the, get these off the needles, but, um, there's just a lot, there's a lot that I want to work on right now. So who knows? Okay. It's time for me to show you my Oracle. You will have seen a sneak peek of it if you follow me on Instagram, but I have made some more progress since then. It's living in my fringe field supply. Wait, French supply field bag. Um, now, if you don't know, this is a pattern that was just released by Kristen of the Yarngasm podcast and Bull and Vine Yarns, and it is a pie shawl that is knit with simple lace and brioche in the round. Um, this is the first time I've done brioche in the round, and I actually think, I will explain in a minute why it's simpler than brioche flat, but I think this project would be so perfect as a first brioche pro project. If any of you haven't done brioche yet, brioche in the round is easier than brioche flat. And there's no increasing in brioche in this project at all. It's very simple lace and the only increasing is in stockinette and lace panels. Um, and then you just do very simple brioche in the round. So. Really great pattern for um, adventurous beginners, people that are just starting to get into brioche or lace, um, I think would be great. So here's what the pattern is going to look like when it's done. It is three color brioche, or three color lace and brioche shawl. Well, it's designed for three colors. You can get creative, I'm sure. And this is what I have so far. So the center is just a little bit eyelidy with a lot of stockinette. Then you have a brioche ring, and then I'm onto this lace ring that is, I'm exactly halfway through it. So I have a lot to talk about with this. First, let me show you my colorways. The center is done with my leftover pine from my Andromeda. And then what I'm working on right now is fly. These are all hedgehog fibers skinny singles. 
So Fly is this amazing turquoise with neon and purple and blue speckles. And then my third color is Pesto, which is a natural base with a lot of neon and that teal, that, that sort of turquoise that you're seeing in the pine. I'm a little bit concerned that the Pesto is not going to be differentiated enough from the pine because they both have natural bases. I think I maybe could have done a better job picking colors, but I'm hoping that how heavily speckled it is and everything, as you can see, they are very different. I'm hoping that that's going to set it aside enough. So we'll see. I think I was just really attached to using these and I, ideally, if, you know, trying to pick, I picked them for the pine because I had the leftover pine. I think ideally, if I were picking for the pine again, you know, it might make more sense to have used the fly and then added something that was, had a different colored base, like purple or something. But I was really attached to the way the fly and the pesto look together. So, you know, you make your compromises where, where you can. Um, so, lots to say about this. First of all, it's extremely fun, as everyone has already stated, everyone else who is knitting it, or, or who test knit it. Um, extremely fun. And, as I said, quite easy. I mean, it's, it's a bit complicated, but it seems more complicated than it actually is. And... And it's just fun. Um, so I picked this up when my knitting was kind of beating me up this week, as I said on Instagram. Um, I just wanted something fun. So I, did, I let myself cast this on, um, even though, you know, I have a lot of cast ons. <laughs> and I, I just wanted something fun. Now, I did have some issues with it that first night, but because it was so much fun to knit on, it still was just such a positive knitting experience that I didn't mind. Um, so the issues that I had were that I started it magic loop because I don't have large enough double points. Um, my double points only go up to like a size two or something, maybe not even. Um, and so I did Magic Loop. And when you're doing Magic Loop, it can be a little tricky to do yarn overs at the edge, at the edges. Um, and this pattern has a lot of yarn overs because Brioche has a lot of yarn overs and Lace has a lot of yarn overs. So I was finding that I, I was adding stitches um, because when you do a yarn over at the edge, say I'm knitting here. And I need this to be a yarn over before I pull this out and start knitting on this side, right? I kept feeling like just doing this, just pulling it this way, wasn't enough. Like it needed to be actually looped. So I kept doing that, which actually gives you two yarn overs. Um, so basically, I just kept creating these like two large holes on the edges because there was meant to be a yarn over there, but it would be too large of a yarn over. Or in the brioche section, I actually managed to add, I actually managed to increase because of my extra yarn overs, because I started knitting them separately. Um, so I just, I just ended up ripping it back, or no, tinking it back, um, because I didn't have a lifeline. So I just had to tink back like, I think like four or five, six rows. Um, Figuring out what I was doing, I began doing the yarn overs properly, and I was fine from there. But I also decided when I got to the end of the brioche to add a lifeline, which I've never done before. I've heard a lot about lifelines, but I've never actually done one. So what you do for a lifeline is you string some kind of contrasting yarn, or in this case, dental floss. Dental floss works really well because it's thin and it slides around and it's really durable. Um, you slide that into one row of your knitting so that you can rip all the way back and it will catch your stitches like a needle. So what I've decided is I'm going to put in a lifeline at the end of every section because the sections are starting to get big now. So at the end of this lace section, I'll put in a lifeline 
and then at the end of the next brioche, I'll put in a lifeline. Um, and the way you do that is, if you have interchangeable needles, they have these little holes right here, which are how you tighten them, right? Well, if you just thread some dental floss through that and knit a row, when you pull it through, it'll pull the uh, dental floss, having threaded itself through that row just perfectly. And then I just knotted the dental floss off with a little um, slip knot so that I can easily undo it. And uh, yeah, it's working great. So the reason I really wanted to put lifelines in this, as I said, is not a super difficult pattern, but it's a fun pattern and I want it to stay fun. <laughs> so I find that it, it, the more you can do to help yourself along, a lot of times the more fun you can have. So I also, I also added all of these stitch holders, stitch holders, stitch markers, between repeats of the lace. And again, it's not that I necessarily have to have those. I almost never do that when I knit lace, but I just find that it's faster because you don't have to keep, you know, if you sort of space out, you don't have to count back and be like, wait, where am I in this chart again? Um, you just, as long as you're ending a repeat when you get to the stitch marker, you know you're doing right. And the same thing with the lifeline. It's like, if you make a mistake, you don't have to tink, you don't have to have trouble picking up your stitches. It's not a big deal. And I just like having those measures put into place so that I can just really enjoy this for the process experience that it is. Um, you know, I don't have to prove to anyone that I can knit without stitch markers and a lifeline. I know that I can do that. It's not about making it difficult for yourself. If you make it easy for yourself, it's fun. So yeah, this has been a ton of fun. I think it's looking beautiful. I am really enjoying the colors and it's just been really inspiring for me. This is, as I said, my first time doing brioche in the round. It's also my first pie shawl. Um, I haven't knit a lot of shawls and I'm getting more into them. And, uh, and I just think a pie shawl is like I, I mean, Tommy said this a while ago, so I've been wanting to try a pie shawl because I trust her. But she said, um, Tommy of Squirrel Pie Productions said that pie shawls are like one of the most fun things to knit. And so I've been wanting to try one and like, she is so right. They are insanely fun. And you add circular brioche to that and it's just like, I don't know what could possibly be more fun. Um, so it's just been great. The pattern is gorgeous. The only thing that could possibly improve this pattern for me is if it were 100% reversible. So just due to the design, as you can see, like this section has a lot of stockinette looking stuff. So on the back, it has a lot of reverse stockinette, which is perfectly fine and beautiful, but it does look a little bit like the underside of a shawl. And the same with the lace, the lace, is looking, you know, stockinette on one side, so you have some more pearl bumps on the other side. So I do feel that this side looks like the underside of a shawl, and because it's brioche, and I love the fact that brioche highlights a different color on each side, I do just think it would be the cherry on top if it felt entirely reversible. Um, but honestly, that's such a small thing, and this is such an incredible pattern in every other way. But it has got me thinking about other ways I could do brioche in the round, um, and I actually have a design idea for a shawl. So I'm gonna talk more about that in On the Horizon, but this has been so fun that it's, it's inspiring me to, um, to wanna do something else I've been wanting to design a brioche shawl for a long time, and um, I think a brioche pie shawl is like exactly what uh, what the doctor ordered. So I'll talk about that more when we get through the rest of these whips. Oh, I also want to show you I have my dental floss actually living in here so that I can easily 
add more lifelines. <laughs> Just make it easy on yourself, people. Okay, I have one last whip. Now, this is an older whip that has been neglected for a little while. It is my Marley, and it is living in my gorgeous Hanna Lisa bag that it matches beautifully. Because it is also lovely coral and cream colors. So, this I think I haven't knit on in about a month. And, um, you know, I love it. It's, it's, a, it's a process knit. It's a lot of fun because it's brioche. Um, and so this is a project for me where when I was more excited about new things, I just didn't mind setting it to the side because I wasn't trying to finish some product. I was just knitting it to have fun. Then when I knit the brioche section for the Oracle and I was onto the lace, my fingers were kind of itching for some more brioche. So I actually have found some, um, put in a little bit of time on it just yesterday and in a tiny bit this morning. Um, so this is it. It's getting quite big now. I believe I have done 21 of the four row repeats and there are going to be about 36 total, I think, and then a border. So I'm um, a good way through it. And here's what it looks like on this side. So this is going to be a big triangle with this as the as the flat and, and side and like the point coming down here. Um, and I'm knitting it in hedgehog, hedgehog fibers, skinny singles, in bramble and coral. And um, the last time you guys saw it, I was here. So I've just done a couple repeats. Um, a little bit in the car on the way to the zoo yesterday, and then a tiny bit this morning. Um, the rows are getting longer, so you're definitely in that black hole space where it feels like you put time into it and then it doesn't get any bigger. But, you know, you just got to have faith that it is actually growing. And, uh, and just enjoy the process because it's brioche. It's brioche and it's beautiful. Ugh, just look at that. I would like to do something with brioche where you switch so that instead of having to turn it over, I think it's called syncopation, instead of having to turn it over to see the other kind, it just switches in the middle. I think that would be really lovely with, um, with something like this that has a nice speckle to it and a solid. I love the way a speckle and a solid look together in brioche. Mm. It's, ugh, it's just lovely. It's just so much fun to work on. So do I have anything else that I wanted to tell you guys about this? Um, this is, as I said, a really a process knit. And so this is also something where I've made little mistakes here and there. And I just try to, try to, um, hope they don't show very much because <laughs> I'm not trying to make it perfect. I'm not going to rip back if it's, um, if it's not fun. You know, here, here's a spot. See where the bramble is going over the coral. Like, I could drop down, I could try to drop down, I could try to rip back, I could put in lifelines every so often so that I could rip back. And those are things that I would do if I were really concerned about making this perfect. If it were a design that I needed to photograph for pattern, if it were a gift, if it were something that I was knitting because I wanted to wear it. But although I will wear this, I'm sure, I'm knitting it because I want to knit it. <laughs> uh, this isn't a color that I wear a ton of, and it's really about the process. And so while I can be a bit of a perfectionist with certain products, uh, projects. There are other projects where I can just sort of be real loosey-goosey about it. And that's what this one is. So it is time to talk about um, On the Horizon. 
So this is projects that I would like to knit sometime soon. Um, and I'm going to insert photos of them so that you know what I'm talking about. So the first thing is, I've been liking the idea of doing a Moral Magic, which would also be very much a process knit. Um, everyone who worked on it said it was just one of the most fun things. And, uh, and I, I like the product, too. I think it's really interesting looking. So, um, I've been thinking about that. I don't have a huge stash, and it's a real stash buster. So that sort of held me up for a while. But then recently I started to realize that I actually am accumulating quite a lot of um, Harry Potter themed yarns. Um, part of that is because I'm in the Homespun House Harry Potter Club. And part of that is I ordered a few from um, Nora George earlier this year. And they're really more than I can make socks with. And they're not all ones that I necessarily want socks out of. Um, so I was thinking how fun would it be to do a marled magic that is Harry Potter themed. Um, not every single yarn that went into it would have to be a Harry Potter colorway, but to use up a lot of my Harry Potter colorways and sort of imbue it with that spirit, I think could be really, really fun. So I'm thinking um, about that, about doing that sometime soon, um, once I have sort of cleared the docket a bit. Um, and then there are a couple sweaters that I want to do. Um, both of them are pullovers. The first is called the Ebba, and it's by Diana Walla. And um, I've actually gone ahead and ordered some yarn for this because I was putting in an order for some yarn for a Christmas gift for Ryan uh, at Knit Picks. So I just threw some of this in um, to make the free shipping <laughs> minimum. Um, so I'm just ordering, I ordered um, Wool of the Andes Sport Weight Non Super Wash. Um, and Wool of the Andes is like very, very affordable. Uh, so I got all the yarn for this sweater for under $20, which is pretty awesome. And you know, it's not super fancy, but this is a sweater where I'm gonna be knitting it in solid colors. And so I find that I'm a person who's more willing to splurge um, when it comes to finding like a really special colorway, whether that's an indie dyer or some of the incredible marled looks that you get from Brooklyn Tweed Yarn. Um, I will splurge for stuff like that. And I'll, and I'll splurge for, you know, lovely fibers when that's what I'm, looking for. Um, but for this sweater, I just needed solid colors, really easy to find common colors. I'm going to do it in black, white, and red. And, um, and I really just needed them to be that sort of nice grippy yarn that uh, is good for stranded work. Not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be something super soft. So Wool of the Andes just felt like a good choice, especially since I have other um, other sweater quantities that are kind of being neglected because I'm more excited about new sweaters like the Ebba. So it makes me feel better about um, buying yarn for the Ebba when I have other sweater quantities sitting around if I'm doing it for a really affordable price. So there's that. The other pullover that I would really like to make in the fall. We'll see if I have, uh, if I finish, you know, the other sweaters in time and it, and it makes sense. Um, is the Nobu by Olga Buraya Kefalian. Um, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. She is one of my favorite designers and I have shared about the Nobu on the podcast before. It's so lovely. I do want to knit it out of Brooklyn Tweed. So, um, the yarn is going to cost me over a hundred dollars. So I think I probably should be responsible and just make the Ebba first since I have the yarn for it. Um, and then if I do finish the Ebba and the Wispy and I still want to do the Nobo next, at that point I can make the decision to buy yarn for it. Um, but if at that point, you know, I'm wanting to make something else, then I haven't already gone and bought a sweater's quantity of beautiful Brooklyn Tweed just to set it to the side because I don't want to do that. 
So I'm very in love with the Nobu, but I definitely think it's a it's something I wanted in the fall because I do want to do it in the color that it's photographed in, which is called Wool Socks, I think. And um, that's a real fall colorway for me. So if I don't get to the Ebba in time and it's sort of getting into winter, then I'm probably going to be in the mood to knit uh, different sweaters, which is um, fine, but you know, I'll probably wait until ne the next fall to actually do the Nobu. So we'll see how that goes. And then um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was my idea for a brioche pie shawl that I would like to um, design. So I have an idea that is inspired by Marie Antoinette, who is uh, an absolutely fascinating character in history to me. I've read three different books about her, um, and I'm a big fan of, there it is, of the movie by Sofia Coppola. It might be my favorite Sofia Coppola movie, which says a lot because I am the biggest Sofia Coppola fan. Um, so yeah, I, I'm inspired by her. I'm going to be knitting it with um, an, a yarn from Knit Picks called Diadem that is 50% alpaca, 50% silk. I have two skeins of it in my stash in gold and argent, which is silver. Um, it's just French for silver. And I figured out that for a pie shawl, because it runs a little bit short yardage wise, those the skeins are 100 grams, but they only, they don't, they're like 360 yards or something, um, not not quite 400. So I decided that I am gonna need actually two skeins of each color. So I checked Knit Picks and they were out of Argent, but they had um, gold left and it was on sale. So I added that to my cart when I was getting the yarn for um, my husband's Christmas present, um, which I'm only not talking about right now because it's not super on the horizon, it's gonna be in the future, so don't worry about it. Um, but I was getting his yarn and the uh, Wool of the Andes for the Ebba. So I threw in the gold because I did find another skein of the Argent on uh, Etsy that someone was desashing. So I ordered those. So um, I'm not super concerned about dye a lot because it is commercial yarn, so I'm pretty sure it'll be fine. Um, and I, I think it's going to be a nice opportunity to knit with that. I wanted to use up those skeins because they were in my stash. And I also like the idea that on my design, I don't have to be too precious with the yarn because it's a little bit more affordable, even though it's a really lovely um, fiber, which is what I wanted. And I was very much inspired by the silver and gold, those colors for, um, for this idea that I have um, based on Marie Antoinette. So, um, I'll tell you more about my inspiration as I actually start to knit it. Um, who knows when that will be. But I think it's going to be really fun to knit. I'm just excited about knitting it and wearing it and my inspiration. Because when I started thinking about how I wanted to do more brioche in the round um, because of knitting the Oracle, I, I just started getting really clear ideas about... Um, what I would want that to look like and I thought of this yarn and I thought of Marie Antoinette um so I thought of her actually because the the phrase let them eat cake which she never actually said um like most historical people especially women she was very misunderstood um but the actual phrase in French is um it's qu'il mange de la brioche which um so brioche, like it's translated as, as cake, but it's really m more referring to the brioche bread. Anyway, um, so sometimes when I think of brioche, I think of that quote. So that got me thinking about her, and she is a huge source of inspiration. So I'm just really, really excited about the ideas that I have. I've sketched it out, and I think it's going to be insanely fun to knit. So, um, I probably won't be able to restrain myself from casting that on sometime soon, but I would like to get some of these shawls off the needles first, because I'm not usually even a big shawl person, and right now I have three shawls on the needles. Yeah, which is really nuts. So, um, 
That's another reason why I've been knitting on the Marley a little bit the last couple days is it's the furthest along. So if I can get it off the needles, then I maybe won't feel um, so bad if I start casting on this design. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, last thing I have for you today is stash enhancement. I'm not going to have a chit chat segment just because I did vlog this weekend. So if you're interested in what's going on in my life, you can tune into that. Um, and because I had so much to talk about this week that I would be going a little long if I did chit chat. So I'm just going to share with you my stash enhancement, which is another bit from Molly of a homespun house for her Harry Potter club. So this is, um, the first of the new three month installment that is done as actually a sock set. So instead of just getting one skein, you get a skein and a mini for coordinating heels, cuffs, and toes, as well as a super, super progress keeper. And I will show you what it is. I am thrilled about this one. So doesn't it look like Christmas? I think these are going to make some awesome Christmas socks this year. So the main colorway is called, you're going to suffer, but you're going to be happy about it. And the mini is called broad in your minds. And if you know Harry Potter, you know that that means this is Trelawney inspired. So you're going to suffer, but you're going to be glad about it is something that Ron says when he's trying to read Harry's tea leaves and he's seeing um, sort of contradictory messages. <laughs> and uh, broaden your minds, of course, is what Trelawney always says. So I thought that this would make some really great Christmas socks, some sort of Trelawney at Christmas time socks. And the Progress Keeper is perfectly a little tea leaf cup, a cup with the tea leaves clinging to it. So I'm really excited about this. I definitely want to make actual Christmas socks with this instead of adding it to my, um, my Marled Magic plan that I was telling you guys about. Uh, because I want more Christmas socks and I want them to be super Christmassy and these colors are perfect for that. I don't really have any other Christmas yarn in my stash right now, so um, I will definitely be casting those on maybe toward the end of November. Yay! So that's all I've got for you guys this week. I hope you enjoyed. Um, do tune in again to check out my vlog and let me know what you think, if you enjoy the vlogs, if you would be interested in me doing a daily vlog for Vlogtober. Um, let's see, what else do I want to hear from you guys about? If you're new, introduce yourself. Um, hit that thumbs up button down there if you did enjoy this episode because that'll help other people find me. Uh, remember to get your FOs in on the Summer Garment Cal by August 31st. Um, and... Yeah, and I will see you guys next week. Bye.